In this line of work, you try not to come into any interview with preconceived notions of how the interview will go, who the person will be, and what the answers they give will sound like. But when you are preparing for an interview, you can't help but build these scenarios in your head. However, I never supposed I'd find a country music star who was through with the corrupt industry and a comedy club with such a supportive, close community built around it. Shy Blakeman is the owner of Rose City Comedy, a comedy club located on Front Street in Tyler, Texas. So come with me as we go to meet him and some local comics bringing comedy to East Texas. So I'm here with Shy, the owner of Rose City Comedy here in Tyler, Texas. And, uh... Just thought I'd, what kind of stories, what he's doing here, and uh, get to know him a little better. Yeah, so, man, how you doing? Thanks doing for good. having me. Thanks for letting me do this interview. Yeah, of course, brother. Can you tell me a little bit about what y'all are doing here? Yeah, so it's called Rose City Comedy. It's a comedy venue in, in Tyler, Texas. Um, as far as I know, it's the only venue committed entirely to comedy between Shreveport and Dallas, uh, and maybe even Houston. Uh, and uh, we're just trying to bring a little bit of something new and, and add to the culture uh, of Tyler, but also give local comedians a, a home to come and kind of focus and and perfect their craft yeah so when, when did y'all start this because i just saw it a couple weeks ago passing by and got yeah. interested uh we actually started it february of 2022 oh, okay. so i mean we're less than four or five months old yeah so what what i guess was there always the idea of opening a comedy club like uh no um i originally opened it up opened up an iphone repair shop uh and had this space that that was included in the building uh that i wasn't doing anything with and i mean i was paying the same amount for rent anyway and not utilizing that space so yeah. maybe I, I, i've like always been a huge fan of comedy uh and during covid i tr i tried it out a little bit as a con or right before covid i tried it tried out tried it out a little bit from the comedian side but then covid hit and kind of killed that uh and i was just like why not give it a try? Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of threw it out there on Facebook and and did a couple shows and like people were showing up and it showed that there was obviously a want uh, for comedy and just something new in Tyler rather than just going to the same old bars and you know. Yeah. So it, it just kind of <clears throat> grew into its own thing, uh, it, it, and it, it's it been a really interesting thing to watch grow. Yeah. So, I, I mean, how much has it grown in the last couple of months? Well, uh, I mean, the, the old room, where w the storefront that people see uh, as they're driving down the road, that was the old room. I mean, and that could hold 30 people. Yeah. Uh, we were doing shows every other Friday. Uh, and in less than four months, uh, we had to switch spaces. I had to switch, put the iPhone shop in the small space and then put the comedy venue in the big space. Uh, <clears throat> and now we hold 65 people and we're doing shows once a week, uh, and the last, let's see, 11, seven or eight out of the last 11 shows have all been sellout. Really? Yeah. Wow. 
and we're not like we have, we're not even really doing. I mean, we're basically just advertising on Facebook. Really? Yeah. So, would you say there's like regulars coming and everything? Like, yeah. Now I think so. Um, we we have had our regulars from the beginning. I think a lot of it was people just coming to check it out and see what it was about, and um, but uh, yes especially since we now moved to the big room and it's a little bit more comfortable. You try to f- imagine trying to fit 30, 40 people in that small room. Everyone's like all scrunched up together and it's like, it gets a little warm and, uh, mm-hmm. and, and we've got, since we moved, moved to the larger room, uh, pe- m- more of those people, uh, uh have been coming back. Yeah. I mean, that was my first question when I first passed by was, how, how do you have a club in the war room? <laughs> well, but see, the, the the important thing, the reason I started out that small, uh, well, it's because number one, it was the only space I had. But it also allowed me to kind of test, market test Tyler. Mm-hmm. Like how big of a, like what, number one are, would people even be interested in comedy? Yeah. Number two, if they are, would they even come? Number three, would they come on a regular basis? And so just starting out small allowed me to keep my overhead low enough that we could learn, you know? Um, And then it was in May, so March, April, May, so... Around the first of May, first Friday or second Friday in May, we made the decision that we had to move into the bigger room because there were just not only were we selling out, like pre-sell selling out, but we were having so many walk-ups and we had to turn them away. That, yeah. So it's just like, all right. Well, the, obviously, this is something that Tyler wants. Now it's just a question of how many nights a week does Tyler want it, and how many times, like, how big of a room can we can Tyler support? Yeah. So we're we're still very in the early stages of learning and figuring out exactly our market size here in Tyler. Um, but like the, the, the actual comedians, the ones that like, cause tonight we're doing an open mic night. That community has grown. People are like, Oh my God, I didn't even know that I've always wanted to try comedy or I, I'm always driving to Shreveport or I'm always driving to Dallas to do an open mic. And then, there's 75 people and you, I'm there till one o'clock and then I got to drive home. So that community has really grown since we've opened up. Yeah. Uh, so I, I guess uh, my question is, you said you tried it out. Do you, do you ever do stand up now or is it just you're no. on the business side? For me, is like my background is in music, right? Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like a guy opens up a bar just so his band can play there every Friday and Saturday night. It's kind of cheesy to me. Yeah. You know, when I decided to open the venue, I decided I'm because I I don't want people to think that I opened up a venue just so I could get up and do comedy. Yeah. You know, so I've I've made the very, like, uh, explicit decision to, once I open this place up, I mean, like, open mic, if I I think of something that I think is funny, I might get up and do, like, one or two jokes. But no, like, for me, I'm, this is more of the business. I love comedy, and I love helping out comedians. I'll, like, I'll, I'll take some jokes that I've had that I think would be perfect for a, a comedian and be like, Hey man, like I'm never going to use it. Like, here you go. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 
So, uh, for people, I mean, we'll go more into other stuff, but for people like wanting to come and do an open mic, is it just walk in and sign up? Yeah, it's as simple as that, man. Doors yeah. open at 730. We have a, we have a sign-up sheet. You just sign up. We give everybody up to 10 minutes. If you don't have 10 minutes, you don't have to take the entire 10 minutes you're not gonna force them to no stay up. no no no, no. <laughs> uh, we got we've got some regulars that i know they have 30 minutes 45 minutes and they'll just come up there's just like one joke they need to work out yeah and they'll get up and they'll work it out and that'll be it yeah you know so so of the regulars is there anybody that you've seen where you're just like this person could actually make it in comedy. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole, like, y you would be surprised the level of talent we have in Tyler. I mean, Brandon Davidson, number one, uh, he's a local here in Tyler. Uh, but, I mean, he travels all over the place. Uh, he just did a show here this past Saturday and killed it. There's another local comedian, Tyler Elliott. It's the same. He he, lot in DFW, lot in Houston, lot in Shreve. Like he travels everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and then we're getting a lot of Shreveport music or uh, comedians as well that are coming in. There's this dude like Mark Pugh. Like dude, oh, he is a he is he is a killer, bro. He the murders. name sounds really familiar. Yeah, he know. murders every time he comes up. It, it, there's just a lot of natural talent in the East Texas area. Yeah. It's just going untapped because there hasn't been anything here. Yeah. Is there anybody local who n never traveled before or anything but just tried it one day? that you would say has that level of talent that's a hard one because you have naturally funny people mm -hmm. and that's a good start but just getting up and talking and telling stories it's like there's a craft to writing jokes, right? Yeah. Um, like there's this there's this one guy, and you'll meet him tonight if you stick around. If you want to interview him as well, that's fine too. Uh, think that out. There's this one kid. His name is James McLeod. Never done it before. Four months ago, it was just like him getting on stage. <clears throat> during open mic was like oh shit here we go and you just like you knew he was gonna it was just gonna be horrible you know but like in the last four months of him coming and putting in the work and every Monday and getting up and trying out new jokes and seeing what works and seeing what didn't he's starting to learn what works for him and what doesn't and he's starting to learn how to write jokes and he's really really surprised me but then there's other times you'll get a guy that's never done it before and he just wants to get up and talk <clears throat> and tell stories and the first time you see him he's funny as hell but then that's all he wants to do yeah and then he'll get up and talk about what happened this week and then it was just it, it's just kind of like Man, sort of the there's difference. no direction there's no, yeah. there's this isn't going anywhere it's just you talk and comedy is about talk part of about talking about your life and telling stories but it's doing it in a very edited and pointed way yeah and when he just gets up and rambles for 10 minutes it's just like uh i thought this guy was gonna like really turn into something but then he never puts in the work Mm -hmm. He just thinks he can get up and talk about whatever, and it's going to be hilarious, and that's not how it works. Yeah, kind of the difference between a guy who's funny at work and a comedian. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, 
if you don't mind, you mentioned being in music before, and mm-hmm. I guess I didn't do my research, but apparently you you were pretty big into music, <laughs> pretty well known. That's, and, that's actually where I spent 20 years of my life, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what, what changes? What, why did you decide to get out, I guess? Man, uh... Music business is a hard business, bro. Yeah. If you think politics is backstabbing and backbiting in a hard life, like, times that by 10, and that's music, especially when you get to the very top tiers where there's real money. Yeah. Like, you know, you're playing stadiums that... You, what was... What's the name of the stadium? Uh, Patriot Stadium. Uh, Gillette? Yeah. When you're playing Gillette, bro, when there's that kind of money on the table, like, whoo, man, it gets devious. Um, I ret- retired as a musician and a country artist in 2012 and I ended up moving because I was just done with it. I was I spent 15 years on the road recorded four albums was on a show called Nashville Star recorded a duet with Miranda Lambert uh, opened for Bob Seger performed with Guys like Big and Rich and Winona Judd and, like, you name them. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, I have more of, I have more of, like, a, it was an older style. Like, what we you were talking about earlier. It, it, more akin to, like, Bonnie Raitt and Waylon Jennings. Yeah. Right? Um, even like, even a little more Southern rock. And at that time, there was that whole shift to bro country. Yeah. Uh, Florida Georgia line had just come out and that single blew up. And then everybody was like, bro country, bro country, bro country, bro country, bro country. And at that time, I was actually signed to uh, a major label under a development deal. We were trying to find my path uh, as an artist. Um, So I was doing a lot of writing and doing a lot of performing and developing and blah, 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 blah. And they wanted me to go broke country. Yeah, and I was like, "Hell no, <laughs> that ain't my speed. That's yeah. not what I'm doing." <clears throat> so I came back to Texas, uh, recorded my third album, "Long Distance Man," and started touring again, uh, just in the Texas circuit, and then ended up recording my fourth album. Uh, which was actually a Live at Billy Bob's Texas album. That was my last album. Uh, and uh, which was like the holy grail of Texas music is recording a Live at Billy Bob's Texas oh, yeah. album. I, I know enough about country music to yeah. know that. <laughs> um, so I did that, and I just kind of was like, I've kind of done everything I've ever wanted to do in music. Yeah. Time to go out and open an iPhone repair. No. No, <laughs> dude. Actually, I moved to... I, I retired. I was like, what else is there to do other than go back from a bus back to a van and then like, just travel and play these... <clears throat> the occasional music festival, but mostly just small honky tonks. I'm like don't literally want to spend the rest of my life like that. It's like, yeah. I did it. Yeah. Now it's time to go live some other dreams. So that's what I did. I'm, I like 
retired, packed up, and I moved to the Caribbean for like five years. Really? Yeah. Yeah, man. So just getting tired of nice weather and beaches, or? <laughs> dude, that's another thing. Like people always ask you, dude. Like, so I earned my dive master certification. That's what I did down there, and then I also mm-hmm. sailed. Uh, I was an able-bodied seaman, and I ended up sailing from Puerto Rico to Venezuela on what they call a traditional rig ship. Uh, most people would look at it and go, oh, pirate ship. Yeah. But that's what I did. It was all traditionally rigged. There was no, like, no mod. The only modern equipment we had on, on the vessel was an engine because the Coast Guard requires for you to motor in and out of port. Yeah. But as soon as we got out of port, man, it was all sales, bro. It was all sales. Was it just trying to get as far away from the big time as you could, or... It was... Just, just something you were interested in? Both. It was me trying to get away from that, but also looking for myself. Yeah. Because when you're, when, when you're, like, wrapped up in that business, and everyone's trying to not only tell you who you're supposed to be, but also like convincing you and they use that man. They've got that power over you. Cause it's like, they're the ones that can make all those dreams come true. Those dreams that you've, since you were a kid, all I want to do is be a rock star. All I want to do, you know, mm-hmm. like, so they had, and it was me just trying to find out who, who, it, shy, is a nickname. I also used it as a stage name. It was me trying to figure out. My real name is Christopher. It was me yeah. trying to figure out who Christopher was, who the real Christopher was. Not shy. No more shy. No more. You know. Who was Christopher? Because I kind of use shy as like a alter ego. That was. That's who I always thought I wanted to be. Mm-hmm. You know, that's in my head, like, oh, like, that's Shy's, that's my, you know, but it's kind of like Shy was Superman and Christopher was Clark Kent and I needed to figure out who who Clark Kent was. Yeah. I read uh, half of Johnny Cash's uh, autobiography, then somebody moved in the library. And uh, he, he talked about Cash being, being that for him. Yeah. That was his persona he put on and stuff. And exactly. That, shy is the persona. Yeah. So how do you get from selling a, uh, what do you call it, rig? Uh, a traditional rig Traditional vessel. rig yeah. vessel. How would you end up back here? Well... After a few years of doing that, um, I decided that I wasn't quite done with music. I was just done with being an artist. Mm -hmm. And what I'd figured out about myself is that exact thing was like, I spent my entire career being told who and what to be. And how to be it. I decided I really want to help artists discover that on their own. So they can live. So they can build their careers authentically. Yeah. You know. Because I mean. Every story you hear. That. Basically. Downward spirals into drugs and alcohol and suicide and whatever are all these people that their entire careers were based off a lie you know this character this persona that was created by the record labels by management by it was like if i could help artists figure out who they are and how to do it authentically and build their careers off that 
then there's going to be a lot less drug abuse, alcoholism, depression, suicide in the business. So I ended up going back to Nashville. Uh, and I worked in artist development and branding. Uh, then that ended up me kind of taking up photography because as you're trying to help build an artist brand, they need photographs, they need graphic design, they need web design, they need to learn how to tell their story visually and sonically and tactilely and all those things. So I ended up getting mixed up in all that. And then I ended up uh, getting a gig with an artist by the name of Brett Young. And then spent the next f three years touring with him <laughs> as his photographer. <laughs> so, like, we toured with everybody from Luke Bryan to Thomas Rhett to Midland, uh, uh, Michael Ray, Carly Pierce, Lady Annabellum, uh, uh, Kelsey Ballerini. Like you name it, like we were on tour with them, and I was sh I was shooting them and shooting Brett and the other artists, uh, and I did that for about three years, and got mixed up in it again. Got mixed up in that like large scale, big money, and I just realized, okay, I'm very unhappy. Yeah. By this time, I'd been on the road for three years straight. In the first year I was on the road, I got it. I ended up getting in a divorce, and it just constantly on the road to the point to where it was just like, and at that level, you'd think it'd be exciting and fun and adventurous. No, man. It's when you wake up, you're in the bowels of an arena, and you're literally just sitting there waiting your turn. Yeah. Like, because you got two other major artists that are on the tour. They got to set up the stage, they got to set up sound. The main, uh, the headliner does sound check first and of course that takes a couple hours and then the two or three does the next sound check and of course that takes a couple hours and then it's you and so you're literally just sitting on a bus until about five or, or six o'clock at night until it's time to go out and shoot and sometimes when you're lucky, it's like you're in a you're in a major city, so and the arena is like right downtown, so you can just kind of like go out and explore, right? Yeah. But what is there to do? Not really anything. So what do you end up doing? You go to a bar and you start drinking. Yeah. And like it, like it literally got to the point, man, where I was drinking. An entire 750 milliliter bottle of vodka a day by myself. And that wasn't to get drunk. That was just to keep the shakes away. Because that's all there was to do. Yeah. Play video games, drink your face off, or smoke a shit ton of pot. And I don't smoke weed. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? So you had two options. Yeah, <laughs> or I've always wondered that how much touring artists actually get to see of any town, if at all. Zero, bro. Yeah, zero. Um, and and I just realized, okay, well, I'm not happy. So I was like, it had been a couple years, and uh, the Virgin Islands had just gone through those two major hurricanes uh irma and maria so i figured a lot of the old school um 
uh, excursion people because I worked in the excursion business. Like mm-hmm. St. Thomas is one of the busiest cruise ship ports in the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. Like, you have seven ships come in a day, bro. I mean, it's crazy how many people. Uh, so I was like, let me call, let me call my old dive shop. And we were we were on this break. I, I wasn't I wasn't necessarily ready to quit. I just knew I needed a break. So we were on tour with Thomas Rhett in Midland, and this is the way it worked out. Uh, we were it was a split tour, so we did fall to winter with Thomas, and then we were gonna break from winter, and then do spring to summer with thomas again Mm -hmm. because that like country music shuts down in the winter right for whatever reason well just because it's cold (laughs) yeah and nobody's like with country music most of your events are like outdoor or like you know um uh what are they called uh amphitheaters yeah. Or if you're doing a stadium, like the stadium, most of the stadiums are open. To open, up. right? Yeah. So it's just country music just dies down. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like, okay, but that happens to be busy time for the Caribbean because everyone's trying to escape the cold and go on a cruise and go hang out, you know, for a couple days in the Virgin Islands. So it's like, okay, I got this break. I'm not going to be doing anything anyway, making any money. And I I need a break from this to kind of like straighten my head out. So I called my old dive shop, asked if they needed anybody. They were like, hell yes, get the hell down here. Like, we are hurting for help. So I was like, all right, screw it. So went down there. And just dove like three times a day, every day for three or four months. Really kind of like cleared my head up. And I was like, all right, well, I think I'm ready to go back and jump on the road. And we were getting close to that time. But February hit, or no, it hit us in late December, early January. COVID hit and it hit the cruise ships first. Yeah. So they shut, they completely shut down the, the cruise ship business. Yeah. I remember that. And when you're on an Island and 65 to 70% of your economy economy is based off cruise ships means 65 to 70% of the people that live on that Island are going to be out of work. Yeah. So I was like, this is not the place to be right now. Yeah. So did it, you, how bad did it get there before you? Oh, I got out before I even knew, man. Like, yeah. the second they shut it down, I was like, yep, okay. <laughs> Time to jump I, ship. I see the writing on the wall here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was, was there, and I was like, okay, well, this is like January. So I'm like, we, we don't jump back on tour till March so I've got like four to six weeks I haven't I grew up here in East Texas Mm -hmm. I grew up in Kilgore and I I was like I really haven't spent any real amount of time with my family in the last like 15 years it's like I'll go hang out with them for a couple weeks and then Go back up to Nashville, find another apartment, and get ready for the tour. Well, I get here, and then February hits here. COVID hits here in February and shuts down the touring business. So now I'm like, shit. (laughs) I'm like, okay, well, now. The tour's done. No more tour. And I was just looking at it and going, well, if I'm going to be, like, this doesn't look like it's ending anytime soon. Mm-hmm. So 
if I'm going to be broke, it's cheaper to be broke in East Texas than in Nashville. Than in Nashville. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, bro. <laughs> so I was like, well, I guess I'll stay here. And then kind of just didn't. I was just waiting for this whole COVID thing to end. And I w- my whole plan was just to go back to Nashville when it ended and jump on a tour and keep on going. But, like, it, a year later, like, <clears throat> artists were just starting to try to tour again. But even then, they didn't have the funds like they used to to pay, like, a $75,000 salary just so they could have a photographer come out and shoot them every moment of every every second of every day, you know? Yeah. So it's just like I finally made a decision, and that time I'd spent a year, year and a half here. I'd really fall in love with how Tyler has, has blossomed and uh, evolved, and there's a lot more culture here than there used to be. A lot more um, younger, adventurous entrepreneurs doing cool stuff. Like, dude, if, would you like when I live when <clears throat> when I lived in East Texas, I would have never even like thought that Tyler would ever have a brewery. Period. Let yeah. alone two of them. You know. Yeah. And it's just like there. There's just all these. It's it's a lot of parallel with what I saw going on with Nashville like 15 years ago, before it like really blew up. It, there was just all these like, and I'm just like, this is like Nashville like 15 years ago, and I'm like, I would be stupid, knowing a lot of things that would work in this town right now, and not pursuing it. Mm-hmm. And that's really what led me to the whole comedy idea. It was like, the town's ripe for it, and nobody's doing it. And if they are doing it, that not that I know of, but if they were doing it, they're not doing it correctly. Because, dude, I'm telling you, everyone's like, I didn't even know there was a comedy club in Tyler. And given we've only been around since, like, February... But yeah. it's like people wouldn't even think that there's a comedy club in Tyler, but people are so ready for it. And that's just like, all right, I guess I'm jumping in with both feet and planting my roots in Tyler. Yeah. So I guess I got to ask you about the uh, iPhone repair. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was that just something you always knew how to do? No, or? dude. It, it, it was a means to an end. Yeah. Like... Uh, I was door dashing for like almost a year and I was just like, I can't do this anymore. I can't not do this anymore. Um, you know, I, I tried kind of promoting my photography to see maybe if that would take off, but just it. My prices just aren't right for this area. Yeah. Like, you see my portfolio. I'm like, what I charge is worth it. But just, especially during a pandemic, and especially, you know, people just, too much competition. Yeah. Um, and it, it was basically, so... I was just tired of doing DoorDash, so I was. It was more out of necessity, man. It was more like, okay, I can spend all this gas and all this time doing DoorDash and making like just scraping by, or I could figure out a new skill and yeah. make more money and drive less and spend less time doing it. And that's kind of, I had this opportunity uh, where this guy taught me how to do it, and I worked for him for a little bit. Uh, And then I ended up buying the business from him. When I decided, okay, I'm going to plant my roots, 
he he was living in he's he's living in Amarillo and kind of running running it from afar and I was just like man why don't and instead of you stressing about this all the time why don't you just let me purchase the business from you yeah so that's what I did uh which which gave me you know the storefront uh, and then that's when I was like, All right, let's give the comedy thing a go. Let's see what happens with it. Yeah. So the comedy thing was just something in the back of your head? just. Yeah. I mean, I never thought in a million years, like, my end plan would to do run a comedy venue. But, I mean, it totally makes sense. I've spent the last 20 years in the entertainment industry. Yeah. You know, and I Might know as well, right? I've dealt with every venue from every size, from you know, a place that holds twenty people to Gillette Stadium. Yeah, I know the ins and outs of touring. I know the ins and outs of booking. I know the ins and outs of you know venues and and the service industry, like, and it wasn't didn't really take any more of an investment it's not like i was like okay well if i start this i'm a, it's gonna like cost me an extra five hundred dollars a month to do it to rent out the space no i already had the space yeah and you know, i was doing nothing with it it was just like all right let's throw an ad out on facebook and see what happens yeah so are there any plans yet to expand or anything or you oh definitely i mean it's it's gonna it's you know, it's going to take some time because that's the biggest thing is, okay, how, number one, how many nights can Tyler support mm. a comedy venue and make it profitable, right? Yeah. And not only that, how big of a venue can Tyler support regularly? Mm -hmm. and still make it profitable and that's the biggest thing so it's like we're doing things in very baby steps baby steps baby steps i mean we just you know prop not doubled our capacity but opened up our our, our we grew our capacity by a third so it's a question of okay can we sell this show? Can we sell this venue out every Friday night that we do it, or most Friday nights, or at the very least, get it to 70 75% capacity on a regular basis? And then if we can, then maybe we look at expanding to Friday and Saturday nights. Yeah. And okay, let's see if Tyler can support a venue that's. Cause a, a lot of venues, like, they'll do comedy one night, and then they'll do a dance thing and another night, and then they'll do, you know, mm -hmm. pool night another night. That's We are strictly a comedy venue, you know? Uh, and as of right now, we don't have our TABC license, so it's BYOB. Uh, and I wouldn't want to turn this into that anyway. I wouldn't, well, man, you own a venue, like, you own a bar, you got to get people in every day. Uh, so it's like, I want this to stay strictly a comedy venue. Yeah. I don't want it to turn into, I don't want it to morph into a bar that happens to do comedy once or twice a week. Yeah. I want it to be a room for comedy. Yeah. So it's just, spend, fig it's spend too much time in a bar on the road. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's just like. But that, but also, it's like that's part of what makes us different, and and I think why people are reacting is so well, it's because we're not a bar, we are a comedy venue. Yeah. Like if we just morph into a bar that happens to do comedy once or twice a week, you're excluding. That well, but it's then just going back to there's nothing different in Tyler. Yeah, everyone's just going to another bar. And, yeah. You know, what's the difference between us and Rufus other than we have 
comedy twice a week. Yeah. You know? So, there there are plans to expand. We just don't know to what level yet. You know? I'm, mm-hmm. but, I'm, but then there's also... a we, You can expand the brand without maybe even having to expand the venue. Because, you know, if this does get popular, and let's say we get to two, three times a week and it's profitable, then that allows us to generate the capital we need that if we want to bring in larger acts, we don't necessarily have to have a larger building. We can go two blocks up the road to Liberty Hall, rent that out, and and Rose City Comedy presents, and Rose City Comedy can be the promoter of the show. Yeah. So I guess as far as bigger acts, like... Who would your uh, top two or three acts you would want to be here? In Tyler? No, j- just any comedian. Um, I'd like to get Chad Prather. Because, but, but, but here's the other thing. Here's the other thing to think about. This is such an intimate venue. Mm-hmm. Like... You get somebody say like Chad Prather, and yes, let's say there's only 65 seats in here, but you can charge forty, fifty dollars a ticket because of the that's who the name is. That's the intimacy. The intimacy is the value. Yeah, like they can pay, you know, twenty, thirty dollars a ticket and go see him in somebody like Chad in a uh, theater, and then maybe get him to sign an autograph while you're waiting, standing in line for it. Or you can come here and you're literally like two feet away from the guy and get a chance to actually talk to him. There's just, there's that intimacy factor. So there's a tons of different, ton, ton of different ways we can expand, um, and keep the brand growing without like, going out and finding a 200 seat venue with tables and a kitchen and like we're just not there yet yeah you know yeah no i'm i'm definitely excited to see i mean just looking online i can see that it's growing and everything and everything you've been saying so if people are interested where can they uh find you online and everything yeah follow us um we're working on our website right now but right now you can follow us uh, on Facebook at Rose City Comedy and then also Instagram. Oh, okay. I'll and, put those in the yeah. description. Yeah, and we post, we post uh, the ticket links for the show every Saturday at noon. Okay. So if you want tickets, that's follow us on Facebook and every Saturday, boom. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for sitting down with me, and it was a real interesting story. Yeah, Isaac, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. I don't know if I can convey the community that had formed in that little building on Front Street. The assortment of people who came to open mic night, or the fun of people getting up and trying out jokes to a small crowd of like-minded enthusiasts. When you, for ten minutes, with the eyes of everyone on you, you find that line that hits, and for a second or two, you know that you had something there. But there were some people there who knew, and they let me sit down and do a brief interview with them. Okay, I'm here with uh, Joey Savage. Hi. If you would just uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do here at Rose City Comedy. I'm from Coffee City, Texas, which is not a city and there's no coffee. And (laughs) I love Rose City Comedy because it's the only venue for comedy in East Texas, which for the past year has been wonderful and I'm enjoying it so much. Yeah. So, uh, 
do you have a history of doing comedy before this, or how did you get started? Yeah, ten years ago, I started going to open mics in Dallas, which were like long lines of people gathered together, and you're on like 60th out of 62, or you know. Yeah. And it was rough. It was rough in the beginning, and I stopped going for a while, and then things opened up here in East Texas, which is great, because I yeah. like this area. Yeah. So what what inspired you to get into comedy? Oh, well, I've always been a, a writer, and I write humor, and yeah. I, I had a humor column in a newspaper in California called Twisted Thoughts, and then I wrote a book called The Vanilla People, which is also a compilation of those um, those reports, and also the a, kind of a autobiographical, autobiographical, and I can talk really well. Yeah. And, <laughs> You're better at writing than yeah. talking, right? <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so, were you you're originally from here? Were you just sending the articles to the no, newspaper? No, I've, I've lived all over the place. I'm a really old lady, so yeah. I've lived in Nevada and California and North Carolina and Nashville, Tennessee, and here. Yeah, just... <laughs> Like traveling a lot, or was I it do, your work? I do, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the interview. Thank you. And, yeah, it's been fun. What was your name again, man? Uh, James McLeod. James? Yeah. So, so, like, how long have you been doing this? Uh, consistently, just doing open mics. Uh, about six months now. I tried it for the first time last year. I went on stage, it was one of those things, they were like, hey, does anybody want to try stand up for the first time? And I went up and I told I told a dirty joke that I thought was funny, it was about 30 seconds and then I, I ran off stage. And it turns out everybody in the group that was there at the open mic, they were all from the same church. And they were there <laughs> to see uh, this, this uh, Christian radio DJ that was performing that night. So they were all horrified. Nobody laughed, obviously. They were all horrified, and that was that scared me from stand up for God. From July till this January is when I started doing it again. Yeah. But um, now I'm just, um, we have this open mic, me and Joey and some of the other comics. We go to a, to a mic in Louisiana. Right now it's just about. Learn how to write better jokes and get get reps in, really. Yeah. So how much writing do you do? So. So you got a pretty good notepad there. Yeah. Uh, like tonight, these are all jokes that I've been working on for a few months now, and I'm just twisting them up a little bit, see if there's a different way that I can tell them to get a better response. Usually with my writing. Uh, of course, I'll, if I think an idea is funny, I'll write it down in my phone right away. And then sometimes it's you have to look at your computer and you have to force yourself to write it out. You have to force yourself to make it funny. Yeah. And uh, but this is just I had this I had no pad in my pen and I was stuck for a few hours, so waiting on the uh, I might as well rewrite it out a little bit. Yeah. So what's your experience been like here? Like, uh, actually, really awesome. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people think stand-up's going to be scary, but we've got a really big community of comics that actually... It really encourages. It's really, really encouraging. You wouldn't expect that. Um... Uh, we, you know, like going up to Louisiana, we carpool together, we, you know, if we're ever trying to like work out jokes or anything, we'll talk about everything, so it's, 
it's not like a competitive environment. It's a very, it's, it's a really warm, encouraging environment. You're all kind of working towards the same goal in the end. Basically, be funnier, learn how to do stand-up better. I mean, that's basically what we're trying to do, you know? Yeah. But the club is freaking awesome, man. We're sitting this is Yeah. I mean, a year ago in Tyler, there was nothing like this. So this is, this has been something. Do you say it's definitely grown out here and everything? The oh, yeah. Scene? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The scene uh, getting the attention of a lot of people, like from the Dallas area, the Louisiana, the Springport area. And it's just, it's becoming like a little, little comedy house by the It's really cool. That's cool, man. Yeah. Hi, I hope you enjoyed listening to the interview, and if you did, go ahead and just like and follow or whatever it is on the platform you're listening to. That just helps me reach more people. Thanks. I saw you just do that. <laughs>